Good afternoon, everybody. Happy half term. Welcome back to week five of our live cook alongs with Chef Tom. Hopefully you remember me. My name is Tom and I'm the chef, the head food educator here at the Hackney School of Food. Um, we've got a fantastic recipe this week. One of my all time favorites, fresh pasta made using just our hands and obviously a boiling water water. Um, we are also going to be making a fabulous tomato, uh, really quick tomatoes. We've got some fresh tomatoes in there. We're going to grate that down. That's going to be it. That's going to be our amazing sauce right there. Um, I'm all by myself this week, it's half term, so all the lovely teachers are, um, who normally help me are having their days off. Um, but um, it's really simple, so hopefully I'll be able to keep up with any questions you might have in our chat box just down there. Um, I'll pop in the recipes as we go along, but we're going to show you um, normal pasta, super, super simple, super easy. We're going to show you our quick tomato sauce. And we're also going to show you a very quick gluten-free pasta. It's a bit more difficult to make, but actually, um, with the shapes we're making today, it's going to work really simply. We're making three types of shapes. We're making peachy, corteccia, and orecchietti, which um, basically are little worms, little sort of like pea pods, tree barks is actually the translation, uh, and orecchietti, which is little ears. Um, I asked you last week uh, to do some homework about how to find out um, the names of pastas. They translate quite literally sometimes. Linguini, that's Italian for tongue. So they kind of like oval shaped, linguini. Spaghetti um, is kind of like for string. Um, Orecchietti for ears, as we just said. Fusilli, little spirals. Penne um, is because it looks like the quill on, a, on an old pen. Um, you know, those big kind of feathery things. So penne, quill. Uh, lots of lovely things, guys. Um, you know, Please pop them in the chat box. Uh, this is my favorite thing to cook from fresh, from scratch. I do it quite often at home. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna pop in the chat box what we need for our pastas and our tomato sauce. Um, but very quickly, very simply, uh, for our normal pasta, we have one medium-sized egg and 100 grams of strong flour. So strong flour or an Italian would be tipo doppio zero, double zero flour. That's really important because the strength refers to the amount of gluten that's inside. Um, if you're using plain flour, it's not really gonna work as well for our pasta today. So strong flour, bread flour, double zero flour, perfect. Uh, for our sauce, really simply, we have got tomatoes, we have got garlic. If you've got a really big tomato, guys, by the way, you can use this. Mine have been out of the fridge. They're quite warm to the touch. That's really important to get a really good flavor from your tomatoes. Um, nice bit of garlic and some fresh basil. We're also gonna be using seasoning, salt, pepper, bit of oregano, and some lovely olive oil. Really, really simple um, ingredients for that. If you are wanting to make our gluten-free option, we have 100 grams in here, or 100 grams of whatever, favorite um, gluten-free flour that you want to use with one teaspoon of xanthan gum, which is the thing that helps us to bind gluten-free flours together, one medium-sized egg, um, and we're also gonna add in a little bit later some olive oil as well. With these um, gluten-free doughs, they tend to be a bit more crumbly, so I also have just a cup of water on hand should I need to bring them together. Um, I don't include that in the recipe because it, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't necessary. It also depends on how um, much liquid comes out of your egg. So those are the ingredients we need. I've popped in the pasta dough. For one person, it's 100 grams of strong flour, one medium egg. For our gluten-free pasta dough, we uh, need 100 grams of whatever gluten-free flour you're using, one teaspoon of xanthan gum, one medium-sized egg, and uh, some olive oil, maybe some water as well, depending on how crumbly your dough is. I'll hopefully be able to show you that later on. Um, and for our tomato sauce, just popping every, all the recipes in our chat box today so you can catch up as you go along. Um, this is um, one large tomato, uh, one garlic, a couple of sprigs of basil, fresh basil, some oregano, salt, pepper, and olive oil. That is simple, okay? Uh, equipment that we need today. We're gonna get a fork and our mixing bowl. That's for our pasta, simple. We'll use our fingers to make the shapes later on. No machines, no rolling pins, not necessary today. For our sauce, a bowl to mix and a grater plus a spoon to help us combine it together and measure out our olive oil. 
for our uh, pasta, when we cook our pasta, I've got a big pot of water, okay? It's about, um, this is a really big pot of water. For the pasta we make today, we want about a litre, litre and a half. It's a huge amount of water. I'm going to get that onto boil because later on we need it to be um, boiling quite rapidly when we're cooking. So this is going onto a three quarters heat to get that nice uh, and ready. And of course, I've also got a slotted spoon to take my pasta out, okay? We're not going to pour all this lovely water away. I will explain that later on, but a slotted spoon is better than a colander. Or if you don't have a slotted spoon, you could use a sieve or something. Something that's really, really important for our water is salt. I'll come to that in a moment. But salty pasta water is going to give us flavour. So, we should now all have our equipment and our ingredients together. While everyone's just getting themselves in a position to uh, cook, to, to make some pasta, to make some sauce, I'm very quickly just going to give you a little heads up about what we're doing here, about all the lovely things that are happening at the Hackney School of Food. So, the Hackney School of Food is this amazing uh, teaching uh, food education hub in the heart of Hackney. We're actually um, in Clapton. We are on the site of Mandeville Primary School, which is one of um, three schools in the Leap Federation, and we teach their children. We don't teach just their children. We're open to uh, the local community. We're open to local schools as well. We've had about five or six different schools and different year groups coming down for us. We focus mainly on primary school children, but that isn't the only thing that we do. We work in collaboration with chefs in schools who are this amazing charity trying to revolutionise um, food, food that is served in schools by bringing chefs into schools. It does what they say. Um, and they recreate different food culture. They rebuild it from scratch you creating lovely ingredients you know there's these recipes going around where I've seen charcoal buns with home cooked fish fingers I've seen lobsters being served in schools the chefs out there are amazing if you go through the chefs and in schools Instagram account you'll see so amazing stories about what they've been up to um, and it's just a really lovely thing uh, they're also uh, bringing food education into the schools where the chefs are at the moment there's 35 of us across london hopefully nearly 70 by the uh, by the summertime and we're really hoping to get 100 um uh, by the end of this year into next year so it'd be really really awesome if you spread the good word about the chefs and schools spread the good word about hackney school of food and guys if you live in clapton and near um mandeville primary school come down when we're allowed, come down, check us out. Um, we've just expanded our offering to from two-year-olds. So from two years old up through to 11 for when you leave primary school. If you come to Mandeville Primary School, you've got this fantastic, amazing resource of myself and the Hackney School of Food on your doorstep. And we do love having the kids in. Uh, we cannot wait to have everybody back in when we are allowed. Um, we've got some amazing things going on in our gardens at the moment we, that we need planting, we need um, digging up some weeds, we need to uh, make sure our polytunnel is ready to go, we need to make sure our apple trees and raspberry bushes are ready. So we always get the kids to come and help us. We also have fantastic volunteers who come and help us, so it's not just about the kids, as I say. Um, when, again, we are allowed, we would love to open this up. We're going to have community events, we're going to have gardening sessions, we're going to have public events where, um, you know, we've already done a few uh, last year. We hope to bring them again to you soon, so, guys. So keep an eye out on our website. Um, keep an eye out on Chess and Schools' website and keep an eye out on the Leap Federation's website. Leap, Chess and Schools, Hackney School of Food. We're bringing food education to you guys, streaming over the internet. Um, we seem to be seeing about three, four hundred of you a week. Plus, some people are even cooking this on Friday for their lunches. So it's really great to see all of the effort that you guys are putting in. And I hope you're enjoying cooking along with myself and with your families. Please do share what we're up to with your friends and families. Share uh, your photos. Tag us so that we can see what you're up to each week. I love talking about food. I love teaching food. And it's a real shame that all I'm doing right now is talking to a computer and not lots of lovely people. So um, hopefully you'll see us soon. Guys, hopefully you can come and see us. And we'll do this in person. We'll talk and we'll eat and we'll have a merry old time and we'll um, run around the garden together. So hopefully you kind of have an idea of what we're up to now. Hopefully you've got your ingredients and your recipes all together waiting to go and you just need me to stop talking about what we're up to and start doing what we're doing. As I say, we're making fresh pasta, quick tomato sauce, and I'm also going to show you how to make gluten-free pasta as well. So the first thing that I've got on 
just to remind everybody, is that my pot of so my pot of water is about a liter and a half. It's a lot of water we need to cook pasta. That's just coming up. You can see the bubbles just beginning to form at the bottom. It's on a medium heat, so that should be nice and hot for us, ready to rolling boil when we cook our pasta later on. But now over to the pasta. So in our bowl, I've also got a fork. I've got 100 grams of strong flour and one medium egg. And this is really simple. Now, there's um, lots of people do different ways of cracking the eggs. Some people do it on the side. I find, particularly if you've got small hands, getting your fork and just giving it a good bash on the side, opening up, is the best way to make less mess. Okay, so all you're doing in your hair is your egg and flour. This is it. This is super simple. If you're not using egg, guys, there's um, roughly about 80 milliliters of water, uh, of liquid, in an egg, so you'd re basically replace that with um, water. Not a problem at, at all. In fact, there's um, yeah, a historical difference in our in, in where they make pastas, where where um, families who had the kind of the access to eggs, they would make egg flour pasta, and families who didn't have um, access to eggs, maybe they didn't have them on their farms or whatever, the more urban environment, they would use water. So the liquid is the same. It's about about eighty mils of liquid into 100 grams of flour. Now each egg is obviously different, so what we're gonna do now, once I've mixed it all in together, is I need to bring this and squeeze it. So fork down, out the way. We just need to squeeze it together. As I say, each egg is different. You know, each hen, depending on if it's having a good day, if it's having a bad day, might lay a slightly bigger or smaller egg. You can see sometimes that there's some flour left at the bottom of it. That means this flour you can see it's not sticky, it's not crumbly. The flour that's in here is the amount. Your egg kind of says, do you know what? I've got enough egg for me, thank you very much. And um, that's why we kind of say about 80 mils of water, but we start off by adding 50 and then a little bit more, a little bit more until you have a nice dough that starts off like this. Now this is crumbly at the moment, so don't worry. Um, the flour that's at the bottom, it's not going to waste. We're gonna sprinkle that over the bottom of our working area. And we're going to need, so I know some of you have joined us in the past a uh, couple of weeks to make doughs, and it's the simple stretching out that we're doing here. So the three parts, pushing forward, folding back, and twisting. Pushing forward, folding back, and twisting. Now, with pasta, this takes two minutes tops. Okay, unlike our soda bread, unlike our flat breads, this is a really quick, really simple, really speedy way of creating um, a beautiful dough. Okay, so you can see already, I've got that slightly smoother edge to it. If I pull it apart, it begins to kind of more like blue tack rather than crumbly. So we're pushing forward, folding back, giving it a twist. Really easy. How do I check this is ready? Now, I mentioned that we're using strong flour or bread flour or double zero flour. Okay, these are all really important because they've got lots of high content of gluten. So I'm gonna give this a little poke and that poke, you see that stretchiness, that's kind of bouncing back, that's the gluten working. Okay, this is why I said earlier that pl uh, plain flour doesn't really work that well for this because we want that lots of stretchiness happening. Okay, it's gonna help us with our shapes later on. Once you have mixed, kneaded, done that little bounce test, you've got that little poke and that bounce back, this needs a bit of a rest. Okay, we just need to let that gluten relax a little bit. So we're gonna pop our bowl over the top and then we're going to move it to one side. And I'm going to show you how to make our gluten-free one. Okay, so gluten-free, remember guys, 100 grams of gluten-free flour, one teaspoon of xanthan gum. The xanthan gum is the bit that replaces um, the gluten. One egg, and that's all in here. So we're going to start the same thing again. We're going to just grab a fork, or you can even crack the egg. So I said I did the fork earlier. Cracking the egg inside like so. And we're also going to measure in one tablespoon of olive oil. Now these recipes, by the way, gang, 100 grams of flour to one egg, that is one person's worth of dough. If you need two people, you times it by two. So it's 200, two eggs. You need three people, 300, three eggs, etc., etc. When you're beginning to get up to like three or four times the recipe, Having a little bit of water just to one side is quite good because you might need to have, you know, depending on 
how much liquid is in your eggs, you might find that that is a bit different. Having a bit of water really helps. Now, you can see this dough, because this is our gluten-free dough, works slightly differently. If I squish this together, it's a bit more crumbly. I'm just going to really try and squeeze it up at the side of my dough. Now, sometimes, you know, if you accidentally get a small egg when you're, you're trying to use a medium egg, sometimes this dough gets really crumbly. Actually, if I look at this, this is working really well for me today. So I don't actually need this bit of water, okay? If it, the dough looked like this at the bottom all the way through, then I would consider adding a, a splash of water into it. But we don't want this to be too wet. If I squeeze it together and it stays together, it should be fine like this, okay? So, Katra, if I see your question, if your dough's really dry, really, really dry, you can add a, a, a tablespoon of water into it so that it looks, rather than looking like this, it should look a bit more like this. So it should feel like a soft dough. Hopefully that helps. Okay, this is the other thing about cooking um, uh, over the internet rather than uh, together is that usually I would come along and we can talk about it. We can see it together. But hopefully just a little bit of water, Catriff, um, that would help for you. Now you can see I'm just repeating that sort of push-fold mechanism, the kneading on our gluten-free not really pushing this too hard. All I'm really doing is activating the xanthan gum until it looks smooth and it's one dough like this, okay? So, again, we need to leave that to rest for a little bit. So, I'm just going to show you over here what we need for our next bit. So, hopefully, you are all ready to come on the tomato sauce with me. Come over to the tomato sauce with me while your pasta doughs are resting. I'm just going to give my area a little clean. Remember, guys, a tidy chef is a happy chef. Having that little area to clean up as you work is really, really good practice to get into. So, hopefully your doughs are having a little rest. The next ingredients we need to use are either one large tomato, or you can see here I've got two uh, medium-sized ones, one clove of garlic, a couple of sprigs of fresh basil, or you can use dry basil as well if you'd want to. We're also going to be using... Salt, pepper, oregano, and olive oil, okay? And um, if your hands are like mine, a little bit sticky from the dough, we can just give them a quick wash, and that's fine. The equipment that we'll now need to use for the tomato sauce is the mixing bowl, as you can see. I've got my ingredients in there already. Um, a spoon to help us measure the olive oil and then give it a stir later on, and then a grater because this is how we're going to turn these tomatoes into the basis of our sauce. So, hopefully you have all those ingredients together. And I'm going to pop you up here so you can see what's happening a little bit better. So, here we go. Now, as I say, these tomatoes, absolutely beautiful. Um, when you uh, have warm tomatoes, this is a really cool experiment you can try at home, okay? Buy some tomatoes from the shop, pop one in the fridge, and pop one out on your fruit bowl, say. Give it a couple of days. And your tomatoes that are warm, give them a sort of like a, a little kind of a little rub like this, and a smell. And your tomato should smell really tomatoey. This is the best way of getting the flavor into tomatoes. As soon as you pop a tomato into the fridge, you take that one out and it's cold, it kind of starts, it's, it gets really watery, it doesn't like cold, damp environments. That's why tomatoes grow so well in, in Italy. You know, it's why it's such a great thing. You walk along the streets of an Italian uh, place, maybe you've been to Sardinia, maybe you've been to Sicily, maybe the Amalfi Coast, you know, all these places, particularly the Amalfi Coast. I, used, I saw big chunks of tomatoes, you know, big vines of them hanging on the walls, and that's how they dry the tomatoes. They get a lovely flavour. So your experiment, two tomatoes. One, leave it outside where it can stay warm for a couple of days. One or two days is going to be fine. Two, pop that one in the fridge. Then take them both out and have a taste of them. Guarantee you guys that the tomato that's lived on the side for a couple of days is going to taste better than the one that's lived in the fridge. Okay? Hopefully, we'll try that experiment. Um, so now... We are just going to double check on my water. Okay, you can see I've got lots of bubbles going on over here. It's perfect. 
I don't have to worry about that now. So your water should be close to bubbling. And then we're going to start grating. So I'm going to use the, the large edge on my grater. And I start with the, the pointed end. Okay, So I've got a plum tomato, which means I've got a pointy end. But basically, you want to start the end that's opposite the, um, the little bit here. Because this is the yellow spot. That's where it hangs on the vine. If you start on the opposite side of that, it means your tomato is going to stay together better when you're grating. And yes, we do want everything to go in. Watch those fingertips, gang. But look at this. Okay. Oh, my tomatoes, which have been out of the fridge for a few days, have begun, you know, this, the aroma of it. Look at that. Beautiful red tomatoes. Going to do this with my second one. Now, you can see just as it grates down, all the skin, all the juice, all the loveliness, all the seeds go inside as we work. Okay. And yes, you can keep these big bits of skin, okay? If you like eating tomatoes, that's going to add extra flavor. Just making sure that you're taking all of the bits from the inside into our bowl here. And then a very quick way of taking the skin off of a garlic. Pop it on the side, just squash it a couple of times. And then what happens is your, your coat basically starts to peel away. So the skin on the garlic peels away and that means you can get your fingernails underneath. This bit is usually the bit when I'm trying to show someone it doesn't work that well. It always works when the camera's not on me. But here we go, just breaking it down. You can see really easy. Now you don't want to really flatten this because what would happen is you wouldn't have anything to pick up and grate because we're now going to grate this garlic straight in here. I don't like big chunks of garlic so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to the small side of my grater great like so. If you don't like a huge garlic flavour in your dinner, in your tomato sauce, then you can just use a half a piece. But as much garlic as you like, gang. You can see there we go, grated into the middle like so. Next thing we do is we take our basil and we just take the leaves off and we rip them in our hands just like so. And do that again. Rip, rip, rip. Okay. Your stalks, we're not going to use this week because it's, it's, they're a bit tough to chew, um, unless you want to get your knife out and really thinly chop it. If not, guys, I suggest holding on to it. Um, if you're making a stock, like I showed you how to do when we laid our tomato sauce together, dropping these in will make an absolutely beautiful um, stock. So, just to catch you up very quickly, I've grated my tomatoes, my garlic, and I've just ripped in my basil to my bowl. I'm then going to take a pinch of salt, a pinch of pepper, or if you'd like to turn this tomato and basil sauce into something, um, something a bit more fiery, we can add a pinch of chili. Okay, arabiata. Arabiata is a classic tomato sauce with lots of chili in it. It actually means angry. It's your angry sauce. Um, for me, for those of you who know who I cook, I'm not a big fan of, of anger in my sauce. Okay, salt, pepper, a nice big pinch of oregano, maybe some thyme if you have it. And then we're going to measure in two tablespoons of extra virgin. Okay, Extra virgin olive oil is really good for sauces like this. It gives flavor. Extra virgin olive oil is really good for you as well in small quantities, but is very good for you. Try not to use uh, an oil that you would cook with. Um, you can see my olive oil is really a rich, greeny kind of color. That is a really good indicator of oil that you used to dress or make sauces with, or is a more pale oil or a colourless oil is one that you generally cook in you know a frying pan or a roasting tray with. Look at that. That is my tomato sauce done. Super simple, super quick. If you've got some toast, pop that on top. Absolutely fantastic tomatoes. But this is actually going to get cooked by the heat of the pasta in it later on. So I'm just going to pop it to one side getting ready, so also it's just going to make friends, all the flavour is going to make friends in there. And if I bring you very quickly back to my water, because um, I want to talk about the water before I, I go on to the pasta. This water needs to be absolutely boiling, so do remember guys, if you are cooking with me right now, then this is going to be on and ready to go, okay? So, very quickly, 
boiling, making sure that's going ready very quickly over here. Okay, I'm just quickly going to wash my hands um, so that they are clean from the tomatoes. That's quite a good and important thing to do, gang, is that if you have, um, if you're doing a lot of cooking, especially with tomatoes, then you may find that the acid in your tomatoes, the thing that makes it taste so good, kind of, uh, kind of messes up your hands a little bit. So give them a good wash and they'll be absolutely fine to continue doing this, okay? All right, so hopefully you are still with me and you are ready to start making our shapes. So a very quick catch up. We have made our doughs. Our water in our pan is boiling, lots of water. It's got small bubbles on it at the moment, so that's good. We've made our tomato sauce by grating the tomatoes, the garlic, ripping in the basil, adding our salt, pepper, oregano, and olive oil. And now it's time to make our pasta. So you can see, if I flip over my bowls, one, ooh, lots of lovely tomato sauce on my salad hand there. Okay, so doing this, one is my gluten-free dough, one is my pasta dough, like so. All right, so we are gonna make the first bit. You can see, as I try and pull it apart, it's really stretchy. That is really good, um, showing me that my gluten is ready. So you can see, I've got quite a large bit in my hand. It's about the size of my thumb, maybe a bit thinner. What we're gonna do is we're just going to roll it in our hands like this. By the way, having a little bit of flour near you at the moment, just like a little pot like this, is gonna help you if your hands get sticky, okay? We're gonna roll it. So we're beginning to make, I'll just go a little bit slower for you. We're beginning to make our peachy, okay? Now you could leave them this length, or what I like to do is I actually like to make them quite long. So we're just gonna start rolling on the sides. You can see I always find this rolling on the sides a bit more difficult. I tend to squash it rather than roll it. So what I like to do is I pick up my hands and I just roll backwards and forwards. You can see going a little bit more slowly as I do this. At the bottom, it's just wiggling out. That's not a problem. We pick it up and we go around like this. And as you wiggle, as you wiggle, as you wiggle, you can see it's getting longer and longer and longer. There we go. Now, that's one. And we're going to repeat that process. Again, a bit more flour in my hand. We start off by rolling like this. So we get about, it's about a thumb size to start off with. Again, guys, this is your pasta. So if you want them a little bit thicker, that's fine. What I will say is that try and keep your shapes consistent in their thickness, in their length, because they're going to cook at the same time. If your one pasta is really thick, say for example, I just kind of got a bit bored with this one and tried to cook this really thick one at the same time as this thinner one, then these wouldn't cook at the same time, okay? So you want them to be consistent. This is handmade, so they won't be absolutely perfect, but they will come together and cook together. You do really want them to be at the similar sort of size, okay? So you're just rolling, it's like rubbing your hands in glee, like you cannot wait to get your fingers ready, get your pasta sauce ready. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Okay, so a few examples of peachy. Okay, next thing I want to do, so I want to grab another about thumb size piece, okay, and then I'm going to rip that in two and roll that. So it's about this sort of shape. Okay, so again, about as long as my thumb, not as thick, probably about as thick as half the thickness of my little finger. And this is the bit that I want to bring you in for a close-up on. Because this, guys, this is called cortecia, which is um, Italian for, for bark. So it's kind of like the tree bark. I also think that these look a little bit like pea pods. Basically, with your um, thumb length bit of um, pasta, you just take your three fingers, push in. As you push in, you just roll it back a little bit. Just like that. And what happens here is you create these little scoops, these little pods. Now what this is really good for is a sauce, like my tomato sauce, that's going to fit in. So if you ever have things like um, little shells, which are consigliere, or farfalle, which 
I've always called bow ties until an Italian chef that I worked with uh, corrected me. And actually, like, farfalle means little butterflies. Okay, but these all things these have little divots and little things in them to collect sauce. So we've got our shape again. I'm going to push in with my three fingers and just roll back a little bit like so. So we have that really nice. We've got a thick bit which is good for chewing, and we've got those holy bits which are good for the sauce to fit into. Okay. You can see, guys, this is hours of entertainment. Okay, so what used to happen with the um, with the you know the called nonnas, the, uh, the the you know the matriarchs of the family, they would make lots and lots of pasta, and they would do this all day long, and they teach everybody how to do it, and they would do this by hand. Okay, and you can see it does take a long time to make a lot of really delicious pasta. You do get the knack of it though. You know, the, the more you do it, the longer you do it the quicker you'll get. Particularly if you make this a big sort of family thing. Okay. Oh, look at this one. This isn't going to turn into a peachy, actually. I'm going to keep rolling. If you turn it into a bit of a family thing, guys, you can sort of like, oh, you try and pick out your own shapes later on. But I really enjoy this. It's sort of like playing with plasticine um, because, you know, it has that similar sort of consistency to it. Uh, if you, by the way, want to show, uh, I'm going to quickly show you, just if you do have a rolling pin, I want to use that. At any point, you know, if you wanted to roll this out like this, we can just, there we go. I'm not kind of sure what shape that is, but there you have some flat pasta, okay? Um, if you had uh, a really big rolling pin, so in Italy they're called bastones, um, and these are, the, these are the things that the nonnas would use, what would happen is they would kind of get their big bastoni. So imagine this is a huge four-foot rolling pin, and they roll out these amazing... Um, sheets of pasta by hand. And this is before the invention of, um, you know, these rolling industrial rolling machines. But they'd have these, and then they just get a knife, and they just kind of cut. They'd obviously do a much better job than what I'm doing here. But then you can kind of see where the beginnings of things like tagliatelle or um, other kind of thick pastas look like this. Okay. So this type of pasta, guys, you know, it's these thin, flat pastas. These will always be made by hand. Um, if you want to make things like spaghetti, you need to uh, get basically what is the equivalent of a giant uh, Play-Doh squisher machine. Uh, what happens is what it does is it squishes the dough. It's called an extruder. It squishes the dough through, um, basically, if you imagine my fingers here are a, a shape. As you squeeze it through, and they come out into different shapes. So this is how you kind of make penne, or fusilli, or spaghetti, which is round. Got another peachy going on here, gang. This is where I kind of go, oh, here's one I should have made earlier. But hopefully you're enjoying yourselves. Hopefully you're keeping up, catching up, and you can see how much, um, how easy it is to make these pastas. I'm gonna, I've got a few bits there, a few bits there. I'm gonna make another cortecia, and then I'm gonna go and show you how to make orecchietti, because orecchietti is one of my absolute favorite simple ones to make. So, reminding you of corteccia, which is the bark one or the pea pod one that I like to call it. That's a little bit too big. You can see if you make a mistake, there's no bother. You can just rip it off, start again, using your three fingers there to push and pull back just gently, corteccia. I'd really like to see what kind of pasta shapes you invent, guys, when you're doing this. There we go. There's about 700 different pastas in Italy. Quite a few of them are the same shape, same kind of shape, but different sizes. So you could have uh, tortellini, which is your stuffed ones, or tortelloni, which is the bigger ones. Um, or if you have tagliatelle, which is your kind of your square flat ones, or tagliarini, which is the really, really tiny ones. If you see something with an oni, it tends to mean it's a big, chunky version. If you see, an, see the pasta shape with an eni, it means it's a kind of a cute little burger. So um, a little trick for you. There's about 700 shapes, but there's about 1,300 different um, names for it. Now, we're going to make orecchietti. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways with orecchietti. First of all, keeping it simple with our hands. Little kind of chickpea sized bit with our thumb, we're just going to push in and drag back. And there you have orecchietti, which is, yes. Okay, I'm going to show you again. So we better have a chickpea sized bit. You want it to sort of um, stick to the side a little bit. So I'm, I'm just making sure there's not too much flour underneath. In with the thumb, push and drag back until it sort of curves over the top of your thumb. Orecchietti. 
These ones are really, really quick to make. And actually, you could probably have a little race at home, so you could probably do this. How many orecchietti's can you make in 10 seconds? Okay, I'm going to cheat and use two fingers. So you're going to push in the tops of your thumbs and then drag back until it curls over, like so. And we have two orecchietti's. If you've got a table knife, so a normal kind of table knife like this, or even um, you know, inside of a spoon or a palette knife, anything like that, the same sort of theory applies. So I'll show you again here. As you push in and you drag back, you end up making these kind of longer shapes of orecchietti. Like so, I'm going to show you that again. Or you can use the tip, so either the side or the tip. The idea is, as you push in, you drag back like so, and you end up with these fantastic orecchiettis. Um, I always I find that it's actually a bit quicker to do it with my fingers, so however you feel is easiest to do. Okay. By the way, gang, I'm at the moment just using my um, normal gluten flour. I'm going to show you quickly with my gluten-free flour, and then we're going to start cooking. So... Um, I'm going to get all my pastas together. So here, once you're doing this, guys, get a plate, a bit of flour on them, and just pop your made, already made pasta shapes on them like so. Different ones like this. So they're ready to go, because this is going to make your life a lot easier when you try and drop it into our saucepan later on. Okay? So quickly, I'm going to show you again. So this is our gluten-free dough. And that xanthan gum, you can see it's helping it bind together. Now, the rolling is the same for our peachy. This xanthan gum, by the way, if you are gluten-free, you're cooking for celiacs or gluten intolerant people, um, then the xanthan gum is really key to making really good, um, amazing pasta or baking like so. Here we go, show you this again. That's a bit better. And this, you know, if you pop that next to this peachy, you couldn't really tell the difference, okay? Um, I'll show you this again. This is my, uh, oop, try that again. Push in, drag back, there we go. So when you're doing the push shapes, because the um, xanthan gum isn't quite as strong as the gluten, you need to be a little bit more gentle, otherwise you push all the way through. But the idea is the same, is that you're squishing and dragging one side, so one side is flat, one side is thick, like an ear. Okay, so repeat, repeat, repeat until all of your pasta dough is a shape that you want, whether it's these lovely peaches. So remember the peachy is the sausage which you roll in your hands until it's nice and long, or you can roll on the surface. As, I, as you can see, gang, I'm not very good at this rolling on the surface. So we're doing that. Your corteccia, which is about a thumb sized piece like this, with your fingers pushing in and dragging back. Or your little orecchietti's, which are thumb in the top, drag it back like so, or using a knife to do the same process. Okay, so hopefully. You have a plate of pasta, which is looking really good like this. I put a little bit of flour on it just to stop things sticking together because we don't want this to stick together before it goes into the pan. Okay, a little bit of flour is going to go a long way there. And then we're just going to talk a little bit about the water. Okay, so it's really, really important that your, f your water is boiling. So we want to cook this really, really quickly. If you um, were like potatoes, say, dropping it into cold water and bringing it up to temperature, um, your pasta would be really soggy. It wouldn't cook. It would just kind of absorb the water like a sponge. So we want it to be hot water. You can see I've got lots of bubbles. In fact, I'm going to turn my temperature up just a little bit so I've got really big bubbles and lots of steam. Hopefully, we will still be able to see. And here's the bit that shows a real Italian, whether you're really Italian or depending on how you're cooking it. So if you're at home in Italy, you've got a big pan of water and you've got a slotted spoon. You don't have a colander. You don't have a big sieve, a slotted spoon. Because the idea is that as soon as the pasta is cooked, 
we take it out with the spoon because we want some of this water to help make the sauce. Now, this water doesn't have anything in it at the moment, just water that is boiling. We need to add some salt. Now, this water is about a litre, a litre and a half in it. We want to add about a tablespoon and a half. So we're talking about 10 grams per about litre, a uh, litre and a half. Okay, the reason for this is, is your pasta's going to be in here for about 60 seconds. So it doesn't have a lot of time, giving that a stir for the salt to absorb. It doesn't have a lot of time to absorb that salty water. Okay, and we're talking about less than 10% of salt in here. And one thing that I always kind of try and get people to, rem to remember is that just because there's 10 grams of salt in here doesn't mean there's going to be 10 grams of salt in my pasta. Okay, you're not going to sit and drink all this salty water afterwards. Okay, it needs to be salty because the pasta's in and out really quickly. Okay, with fresh pasta, it's, it's about 10 grams per litre, litre and a half. Remember, there's no seasoning in here. There's only a pinch of seasoning in my tomato sauce. So this is really kind of the base of your flav flavor, okay? So we're talking about 10 grams, well, that's probably um, about two level tablespoons uh, of salt into our liter, liter and a half water, okay? Lots of big bubbles, you can see now. Lots of steam, we're ready to cook. So I hope you're with me, guys. In we go. So this is why having a plate with your pasta on is really simple. We're gonna drop all that pasta in, like so. And as soon as it goes in, we're gonna give it a quick stir. And you'll notice that your pasta does, your pasta water does stop boiling. That's because you've just dropped cold things into it. Now remember what I said about having um, a good uh, amount of thickness. You can see that actually some of mine, so the ones that I rolled out thinly have floated to the top already, whereas some of the thicker peaches are still at the bottom. When they start rising to the top, this is an indication they are cooking correctly. So I'm not gonna time it. I don't have a watch here. I don't have a, a, a stopwatch to say, right, it's gone in 60 seconds. I sort of go, right, in it goes. Things float to the top. And this works for fresh pasta. Things float to the top. I'm gonna give it about 30 seconds, okay? You will notice that as your pasta cooks, if I give you a close up of this one, guys, this is my uh, pasta here. It's quite yellowy in color. Whereas looking down into my pan, I'll grab one out that's nearly cooked. It's quite, it's quite pale in color, okay? So paler, cooked, darker, not cooked. You can also see at the top of my pasta pot that there's lots of foam and, and coming on the top. This is because the starch from the flour is helping things cook, it's beginning to cook. This is actually another way, another reason why, sorry, that we're making extra flavor in our sauce because that starchy, salty water is gonna go into our sauce and it's gonna create a really delicious, um, starchy loveliness. Um, it's the only best way to describe it, basically. It's that kind of extra creamy, thick, luxurious flavors. You can see also the size of things when they're cooking. So they're kind of puffing up into about double the thickness, double the size. Three indicators that we've got our pasta that's cooked. One, they begin to float to the top. That's the first indicator, it's not ready yet. The second indicator is your color, so it goes from a darker yellow if you're using eggs to a, a, paler, a paler yellow. And then you've got this sort of foaminess happening on top, that's good. And then the last thing is that they've doubled up. Okay, the, uh, the last thing to check if you really want to, you know, I've cooked hundreds, maybe a thousands of pasta dishes. Um, I can tell how I like my pasta, but as you're getting to learn how your pasta is cooked, how much you like it, how much um, bites to it you like, you can taste this, okay? So it should be um, soft with a light little bite in the middle, okay? This is called al dente. And al dente means with bite, to the tooth, literally in Italian. And what that means is it's got, it's got texture, it's got chewiness to it. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm just picking up, letting most of the water fall off, but then not being too pressured. You can see there is water going into my sauce, like so. Oh, those peaches are enormous now. And hopefully I can do good fishing in this. You can see guys, that actually I've, I have mixed in my gluten-free flowery um, pasta shapes in this. 
Okay, they are, have cooked really well. They stay together well. But that's really important that you don't overcook them. So they're looking probably about 60 seconds, one minute 30. Look at this, guys. We are ready to go. I can turn off my water. I might add just a spoonful of that into my sauce, and then we're going to give it a stir. Look how thick that rich grated tomato. There we go. Covering my pasta sauce. Beautiful. Okay. Now, we're going to do one very quick um, taste to make sure that we are happy, okay? Um, if we don't taste our food before we serve it, you know, we, if the chef isn't happy with the food, your guests probably aren't going to be happy with it. So we're going to have a little taste. Absolutely delicious. There's only one more thing I'm going to add to this pasta, and it's um, a secret ingredient which makes life tastes better really that's a little bit of cheese okay so even though you saw how much salt went into my water that hasn't translated into a salty pasta dish that's translated into a really delicious well-balanced pasta dish which is um really really the key to making fantastic dishes particularly with pasta you know that that right level of saltiness so I'm going to bring you down. So I'm going to bring my camera down here to show you my plate as we plate up. Plate. And here we go, guys. I'm just going to add my pasta. So that's my corteccia to start off with. If I flip him over, you can see exactly as I suggested, my sauce has been captured inside here. The same thing is happening with my orecchietti. My peachy is coated in this nicely. You can see all the little kind of rough edges and the aroma, you should really have a good strong smell of your tomatoes um, coming through this now because the hot water, the hot pasta has cooked that. Oh, fantastic. Look at that. Everything homemade absolutely from scratch. The last thing I'm going to add in on top here, as I said, a bit of cheese. I'm using a little bit of Parmesan, but uh, a good uh, strong kind of salty cheese is good. A little bit goes a long way with the strong salty cheese. And here we go, gang. This is speedy, fresh pasta, all made by our hands. Tomato sauce made so quickly, really great for us. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope your pasta is ready to go, okay? If you are, by the way, making lots of pasta. Fresh pasta is something that is you kind of you make and you eat straight away. If you were making a big batch of this and you potentially wanted to make it for later in the evening, um, putting a, a, a tea towel over the top, not a damp one, just a clean tea towel over the top of your mixture with a bit of flour in the pasta so it doesn't stick together um, and leave it in the fridge, that's absolutely fine, okay? Um, your fresh Fresh pasta that you buy in supermarkets, it, it works slightly differently to fresh pasta that you make by your hand. Um, so a bit of flour and tea towel in the fridge. And just pop it straight into the um, boiling water, straight from the fridge, absolutely fine. It might just take an extra 30 seconds to a minute to cook. This uh, is one of my favorites. You know, this dish, such a simple, quick thing. Depending on how quickly you use your thumbs to make the orecchietti, your fingers to make your corteccia, or your hands to roll the peachy. Um, I love doing this. It's a really great dish, really full of flavor. As I said, guys, the recipe for this um, will stay on our website after, the, after we've finished, so you can recreate this anytime. Hopefully, um, half term uh, is a time for the children, you guys, to get into the kitchen and, and cook along or even make dinner for the family. Um, you've got a whole repertoire now, guys. Week five, um, you should be making soups and baking breads and making pasta and baking uh, beetroot. Um, Oh, I nearly slipped. A, I've got a, a secret for you guys. We've got, I'm going to tell you what's happening next week in a second. But lots of different, absolutely fantastic recipes that I hope you've been cooking along with at home. Next week, we're back to, back to school. Um, some of us are. Uh, we are going to be making one of our absolute favorites, one of our absolute classic recipes that um, chefs and schools love to teach in their kitchens. And that is beetroot chocolate brownies adding beetroot into chocolate brownies it makes them really delicious nutritious and it also helps us drop sugar levels in a treat so we don't have to um worry about you know we're getting veg we're getting fruits we're getting goodness we're also baking really delicious things so i hope you're gonna enjoy us and join us next week um for that 
Otherwise, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, enjoy your tomato pasta. And uh, I'm going to take tucked in now. Hopefully I don't too, make too much of a mess. But one appetito. We'll see you next week.